Hey everybody, so this is an instruction video on how to contribute to open source projects, in particular to Scikit-learn. I'm Andreas Muller, one of the core developers of the Scikit-learn project. Thanks for uh, Reshma and the Data Umbrella for organizing this sprint. So I really want to give you just a very brief overview of uh, the technology behind contributing to open source and the steps of getting your first contributions in. So first off, uh, a great way to communicate with the developers is the Gitter channel. You can find that at gitter.im slash scikit-learn. For the Sprint, there's a channel called Sprint, and there's also a scikit-learn channel that's just a general channel that you can find at gitter.im slash scikit-learn slash scikit-learn. During the sprint, we will also use a discourse. And so during the sprint, the discourse might be the best way to communicate. But after the sprint ends, uh, the core developers will probably not be staying around on the discourse, but you can always go to the Gitter channel for help. So you already joined us, and or at least you're looking at this video. So uh, I hope you're already highly motivated to start contributing. Still, I want to go over a couple of um, reasons you might uh, want to contribute. For a lot of people, it's about giving back to the projects that they're already using. So the users of projects are usually the best contributors. And so uh, hopefully open source projects already have helped you in your uh, coding journey, in your job, and so on. And uh, contributing back is a great way to give back to the community. It also gives you a great opportunity to learn from the other people involved in the project, um, which are often uh, senior developers, uh, which will give you feedback about like coding style and also on how to use the different projects and how to interact. It also allows you to address issues that have always been bothering you about the library, like fix things, fix documentation, and just make the uh, projects better. Also, it'll just get you more familiar with the data science tools if you're uh, directly contributing to the projects. Um, definitely, contributing to open source can also be helpful uh, in looking for jobs, though if this is your own, uh, only motivation, um, it might not work uh, out so well because open source is really about the community and um, Unless you're really interested in the project, you probably won't be able to uh, stick around for too long. So really what we're uh, mostly in for is giving back to your projects, interacting with the other contributors, and just uh, having fun working on the projects. So now let's get to the technical part. So first I want to talk about the setup. If you want to develop a Python project, Obviously, you need to first have a local installation. And so, if you already have a working Python environment, that's fine. Uh, if not, I would say just install Anaconda. It's usually the easiest way to go. If you have a working environment already, make sure you're not using the system Python, in particular in OS X, but uh, that you're using a separate environment to do your development in. If you already have an Anaconda installation, just create a, se a separate virtual environment for the sprint. So I give the command here, which is kind create dash n, and I gave it a name for this environment here, call it sklearn-dev, and then all the packages uh, that we'll depend on, numpy, scipy, matplotlib, pytest, sphinx, scythe, and ipy kernel. So we're actually not installing scikit-learn using conda, we're going to install the development version. And so um, then you can activate this environment using source activate sklearn dev or conda activate sklearn dev, I think on Windows mostly. Then we, are, if you want to work on the, uh, on the documentation, you also need to install the things gallery package. This is not on main conda, so you need to install it from the conda forge channel using conda install slash, sorry, conda install dash c conda forge sphinx gallery. All right, so now you have your uh, 
Python environment set up, you have a, a separate environment for scikit-learn development. Now you're going to get the newest development version of scikit-learn. To do this, first you go to the main scikit-learn repository, github.com slash scikit-learn slash scikit-learn, and you'll create a fork. The fork is basically your own personal copy of the repository on GitHub. You can do this by clicking the fork button on the top right here. This will create your personal fork um, and will take you there. So you can see here in the top left, this is my fork, amuller slash scikit-learn. Amuller is my GitHub handle, so we'll have your GitHub handle there. And you can see it's a fork of scikit-learn slash scikit-learn domain repository. So this is now your own private copy on GitHub. So th this copy you have write access to, and you can make changes on, on this. From there, you'll get your own local copy on your own machine by cloning it. And so there's this uh, green button, clone or download, that you can see here. You click on this, and you can copy the link and do git clone with this URL. And this will download a copy to your local machine, your laptop or uh, PC. When you do this, one thing that's important is that uh, you use HTTPS. So you click here and you use HTTPS and you'll get an HTTPS address. Um, I'm using SSH, which is easier if you has, have SSH keys set up on your local machine. If you don't have set SSH keys set up and you haven't put them in your GitHub account and so on, then just use HTTPS, it's gonna be much easier. Once you downloaded the repository from your clone, you also want to add the main repository as an upstream so you can download the newest version from the upstream repository if someone else makes changes. You can do this within your repository by doing git remote add upstream and then the uh, URL of the main repository, https github.com slash scikit-learn slash scikit-learn.git. All right, so now you have your local copy of the scikit-learn development version, and now we want to install it. So we want to build it and install it. And the easiest way is to go to the folder that you just uh, cloned and do pip install dash e dot. This does an installation, which does the building and will add it to your Python path. The dash e makes it an editable installation, editable, not edible, editable installation, which means that if you change files in this folder, it will be automatically reflected in your installation. This will override existing installations, so make sure you don't have an installation of scikit-learn. So make sure you do uh, conda uninstall scikit-learn this environment if you accidentally installed it earlier. If you're on Windows, to install it you will need a C++ compiler, um, so you need to install the Visual Studio Toolkit, and um, if you try to do pip install dash e dot, it'll probably give you an error message, and the error message will tell you exactly what to download and where. For uh, OS X and Linux, you'll uh, have compiler probably already installed, so you don't need to worry about that. So then you have your uh, build installation, your fresh installation from the uh, development branch of scikit-learn. Now you have to uh, pick an issue to get started on. So I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but uh, we selected some of the issues, so it might be easiest to pick one of these issues. Um, you can find the URL here. You, hopefully you downloaded the slides so you, so you don't have to type all of this. Then comment on the issue, say I'm working on this, or there's also a command now where you can just say take and the bot will assign the issue to you. Before you start working, make sure you, are, you have the uh, very current version of the upstream master, so of the main repository. You can do this by doing git pull upstream master. This is why we added the upstream repository earlier. If you want to start from someone else's pull request, where they already started some work but then stopped and you want to finish it off, you can get their code using this git command down here, git fetch, and then uh, the URL to their repository uh, and then their branch name, colon, whatever branch name you want to use locally.
So before you start coding, uh, you want to create a new branch for your feature. You can do this by doing git checkout dash b and then a name for your branch. You shouldn't work on your master branch and you shouldn't make changes to your master branch. You should always work on a feature branch. So for example, if you want to improve the documentation for random forest, you might do ooh, git checkout dash b uh, random forest underscore docs or something like this. Just This is mostly for you, but it's useful if it has like a understandable name. Then uh, you make your changes. We'll talk a little bit more in detail about that. So you uh, fix some bugs or improve some documentation, whatever you want to do. Um, then you run the tests with PyTest sklearn. PyTest sklearn will run all of the tests. You can also uh, run just individual test files if you want. And finally, run Flake 8 on all the changed files. So Flake 8 is a linting tool, so it will uh, show you formatting errors and like uh, unused statements and so on. If you don't do this, they'll probably uh, prop up later in the continuous integration, and you'll definitely have to fix them before we can merge your pull request. So now let's say uh, you fix the issues you want to fix, you command them locally on your branch, and you run the tests and you run flag 8 and everything passes. Then you can push the change that you made locally to your GitHub repository using git push origin and then the name of your branch. This pushed it to your fork, to you, so to your personal copy of scikit-learn on GitHub. Then to get it into the main repository, you do what's called a pull request, which basically asks the developers to take your changes and integrate them in the main repository. You can create a pull request by going onto the main repository, scikit-learn slash scikit-learn, and if you push to your, your repository, you will see this green button here saying compare and pull request. So this will take you to an interface where you can create a pull request. It will automatically fill in the things here at the top, which will basically say um, from your fork, your branch, you want to uh, do a pull request to scikit-learn master branch. But that will usually be automatically filled in for you. What you have to do is first you have to give it a title. If you want, you can preface the title by either MRG, if you think your work is ready to be reviewed and merged, or WIP, if you think it's a work in progress, meaning you still need to want to make some changes, you just want to sh uh, show off the work you've done so far. you usually want to give this a descriptive name, so something that someone can read and they know exactly what you're working on. And so remember scikit-learn is big, and so if you say um, change and classes attribute and you don't say which model this is in, this might not be uh, super useful. So be precise and specific, but like, don't make it too long. If you reference an issue that you're fixing in the title, GitHub will actually not link it. But it, so it's very important that you reference any issue that you're fixing or that you're related to or any pull request you're taking over in the description of the pull request. So here, so here you want to say fixes issue X. There's actually some magic words on GitHub that um, mean that if you say fix X or closes X and then the pull request is merged, GitHub will automatically close the other pull request. So if you're completely fixing something that is in an issue, say fix this issue, and then the pull request will be automatically closed. If you're fixing only part of an issue, or if your issue has like many small parts and you're doing one of them, please don't say fixes issue or um, closes issue, because then if your thing get mer gets merged, GitHub will automatically close the whole the whole issue for everybody, and you, uh, then someone else needs to reopen it if it's still current. So use the fixes issue number, but only when it's appropriate. And definitely, definitely mention any issue or pull request that's related. All right, so let's say you opened your pull request. Uh, then at the bottom of it, you will see the continuous integration suit running. 
So the diagrams will be a little bit different these days because we're mostly using Azure pipelines. And so you want all of these to be uh, green check marks. If not, then you can click on details and it'll tell you why a test is failing. And this will hopefully tell you what you need to address. If this is unclear to you, just ask a question on the pull request or on the issue tracker anywhere, and uh, people will be happy to help you to clarify what it is that you need to fix for the test to pass. Also, it's not enough that the tests that were there before passed. Whenever you change the code, you also want to add a test that tests the code that you added. If you fix a bug, that's called a regression test. But also if you add a feature, you definitely want to add a test that tests the feature. We won't merge any pull request without a test. And so basically if you made any change to the code at all, it's very likely you also need to make a change to the tests or make an addition to the tests. If you don't know which test file to look at, you can probably do a git grab to find it. If not, uh, just ask which file the test should go into or what should be tested. All right, so let's say you edit your tests, all the tests pass, um, everything is green. What's next? So for, then you will get um, reviewers from the core developers probably. It might take some time, particularly during the sprint because people are quite busy. Usually reviewers will have comments. It's very unusual that uh, someone will say, oh, your pull request is great, we can just merge it. The pull request review is a really, really important part of open source and it's the main way that new features are discussed. So um, don't be disappointed if someone says, well, I should think we should do it this way or that way. This is really uh, the main way that developers communicate. And so it's not like they're rejecting your pull requests. Basically every pull request undergoes changes. I've been with the project for a long time and basically any pull request that I do will have a long discussion and will undergo go many iterations before it gets merged, if it gets merged. And so um, if you're less familiar with the project, it will probably take even more iterations. And so that's just completely normal and it's the way that you'll learn about the practices in the project and um, also how you learn to improve your coding style. To address uh, any comments, you can just update the branch you have locally and push to your fork. That will automatically update the pull request. So you don't need to close the pull request and open new pull request. The pull request will aut automatically update with any changes you have. This will probably go back and forth a couple of times, and then once the reviewers are happy, they'll approve the pull request, or maybe change the title to merge plus one. Um, but I think these days we mo usually use the GitHub approve feature. You need uh, two approvals from scikit-learn co-developers, so these are people with commit rights on the scikit-learn repo. Once you have two approvals, your pull request probably gets merged. It might sometimes take some time to get reviews, so please be patient, but you can also feel free to ping issue and ask for reviews. Sorry, to ping um, developers on your uh, pull request or in a chat or in person. Well, in person is uh, hard these days, but like in whatever online platform we're collaborating. One aspect that I think is quite important is finding issues to work on. So ideally you find something that you're interested in, but you should also start with something that's really, really simple. If this is your first open source uh, contribution, or even if it's your first contribution to the scikit-learn project, um, even if you have contributed to other projects before, really start with something super simple. As you might have noticed, there's a lot of process to all of this, like working with Git, working with the continuous integration, working with the reviewers, and so on. And so even if it's just a single line code change or a single line documentation change, it can be really useful. And it's important to uh, do a small thing to get up to speed and get it merged. Before you attack anything big, still just do something simple first. As I said before, um, there's a thing that's linked here at the bottom where you put we uh, put some issues that are specifically uh, we marked for the sprint. So these are probably uh, all quite good. Uh, other than that, there's tags on the repository. 
the most important tag is maybe a good first issue. Good first issue issues are good if you haven't contributed to scikit-learn before, and that should be pretty easy and straightforward. Things that need someone to work on them should be tagged with neat contributor, though that might sometimes be outdated. But you should ch check um, things that are good first issue and neat contributor. There are also things that are uh, marked easy or sprint. So easy are those that are easy, but maybe not great for the first contributors, or sometimes they may have both tags. So there's also other ways to uh, contribute than finding an issue and working on them. You can also just fix something in the docs that's unclear. You don't necessarily need to open an issue for this. So just like improve the documentation if you uh, uh, if there's something you don't like about it, or just open issues. Open issues about unclear docs, about features that you find weird, about examples that are not helpful, um, about bugs you run into. So Sprint can be a really great opportunity to open issues about things that you don't like about the projects, problems that you run into. And having this feedback is really, really important to improve the project. Another thing you can do is find a pull request that someone else made but didn't finish. So if there was reviews by uh, the developers, but then say after a month or two, people didn't come back and address their issues. Uh, usually we assume the issue is up for grabs. It's polite to ask, but they might not have time to um, answer you in the time it takes for this, like in the one day of the sprint. So either just ask, say, are you still working on this? Or um, in some cases, it might be fine. Just start working on it and say, okay, it looks like you're not working on this anymore. Um, I'll take it over. In this and in any other co um, communications on the issue tracker, of course, always uh, be nice, be courteous, be productive and constructive in your feedback. You can also start reviewing, in particular, reviewing pull requests or issues open by other people at the sprint might be useful because they're usually at a more introductory level. Um, but you can try to review any pull requests and issues. Reviewing issues might be a little bit more straightforward. So if you want to check an issue, you want to see, uh, is this issue reproducible? Is it clear what the person is reporting? Did they give um, the, a minimum reproducible example? If so, can you reproduce it on your machine? Did they provide data? If they couldn't provide the data, could they reproduce it with a synthetic example? And uh, so these are sort of all the things that need to be present. If they're not present, you can ask for the person that opened the issue to provide them. If something's not clear about the issue, also feel free to clarify, or like ask for clarification, I mean. And then you can try to reproduce the issue. So just reproducing it and making sure it's easy to reproduce it is already quite helpful. Some of the issues might already be fixed, and so you can say, um, oh, this has already been fixed in this and this version because we have very old issues going back several years. So um, triaging issues is a very useful thing to do. Some bugs are not confirmed, so you see if you can confirm it and under which, con under which conditions. You can also uh, review pull requests, particularly those for documentation on whether they're clear, is the language clear. Um, you can also review code changes, um, either on like, do they have tests added? Do they adhere to the styles? Do, uh, does continuous integration pass? Um, and then maybe, uh, did they mention the issue they're addressing in their description? So all of the things that I said you should do for your pull request, you can check are the other people in the sprint or generally anyone that did a pull request, are they adhering to these standards? Um, if not, you can ask them to do it. Of course, always be uh, nice and polite. You can also try to uh, review code changes to see are they actually addressing the thing that they want to address and are they addressing it in a way that you think is good. Uh, this might be a little bit more tricky, but uh, you should definitely give it a go. And if something is unclear, just ask for clarification. And also, don't don't be hesitant to provide feedback. Just always be um, like uh, 
uh, polite in saying like, oh, maybe um, I would have done it this way. Is there a reason you do it this way? Um, and not say, don't say like, oh, this is a bad way to do this. You should do it this way. Um, there's probably a reason someone did it the way they did. So just um, always be nice and just rather ask for clarification instead of assuming. A couple of things on the uh, workflow during the sprint. So you're highly encouraged to do pair programming. I find it's much more fun and you can get much more done doing pair programming. This time around, it will be remote pair programming using this course. Uh, it's maybe not entirely as good as doing in-person pair programming, but I think it's still uh, quite a lot of fun. If you're doing a pull request or an issue, just add mention the other person is working on it, so they'll get a ping in their emails. Make sure to follow up on your work. So expect that there's a lot of back and forth in discussion, and so uh, make sure that you catch any reviews you get on your pull requests. And really, um, it's important to ask the project for you to um, really get your contributions merged. And so, really try to get uh, follow up during the sprint, but also ideally follow up after the sprint. Really, what we love the most is finding new contributors that keep coming back to the project and keep coming back to contributing. It will be uh, more. Uh, easy and more satisfying to contribute to the project uh, the more you get involved and the more familiar you have become. You'll be able to do more and more interesting things, you'll be able to add cool new features to the project and so on. And so it's also really um, a way to grow with the project and to learn much more by, coming, by becoming more long-term engaged. So we uh, will probably try to do some follow-up events for the sprints. Otherwise, feel free to follow up on the issue tracker. The issue tracker is really the main way the developers communicate. There's also a monthly, uh, monthly developer call that you can join if you want. Uh, join the email uh, list or just talk to us on Gitter. And so, yeah, make sure you know which email address you um, use on your GitHub account and check that email address for any notifications or check the notifications directly on GitHub. So, as I said, so there might be some things that you um, can't finish up during the sprint. It would be really great if you can follow up and get your pull requests merged. Um, so the pull request on GitHub is really the best way to communicate and um, this is a, a public discussion where all of the core developers or really anyone else on the internet can uh, answer question and help. As I said before, we'll be using a Discord during the sprint, but the core developers will probably not be around uh, on the discourse most of the time after the sprint. So a good idea is to go on the Cyclone Sprint channel or just the general Cyclone sp uh, channel or just talk in the issues and pull requests. So really, um, I want to emphasize that it's a good idea to start with something really, really simple as a first contribution and then work your way up from there. My first contribution to scikit-learn were fixing some typos in the documentation. And uh, if I start contributing to any other project, usually the first thing I do is like fix a line in documentation and just to, you know, um, get started with the project and uh, start communicating and start getting into the workflow. Yeah, so um, if you want to add a major feature to scikit-learn, that's probably not something you can do in a day. Adding a new model to scikit-learn uh, is usually something that had take many months and it's not something you should try to attempt at the beginning. So really start with something simple and then maybe if you got your first uh, first two pull requests and you can uh, work at adding like a smaller feature, but uh, don't count on adding a big feature anytime soon. That is because scikit-learn is already quite mature library, and so um, it's moving quite slowly, and so it's hard to add anything big or make any big new changes. Also, there might be a lot of interesting issues that are not appropriately tagged, so uh, if you're interested in a particular topic, you can just uh, search that topic on the issue tracker or on the pull requests and see if there's something interesting happening there. 
So with this, I want to say um, enjoy the sprint and uh, thank you all for your help. And I hope you have a lot of fun. Um, you learn a lot, work together with your sprint partner, and I hope you'll come back for more sprints or you just uh, keep engaging on the issue tracker. All right, so thank you so much.